things and Drupal Camp, New Jersey. How many first timers? All right, always great to see some first timers uh, here. How many first time Drupal event? Okay, cool. Um, well, this is great because you get to come before the really huge celebration that we're gonna have next year at Drupal Camp, New Jersey. So make sure you're at that one. Also, if you're new, if you've been coming for a, a, a while, I know that there's some, some plans to put together a really super camp for the 20th anniversary of Drupal and the 10th anniversary of the, of the camp. Welcome. Um, so, uh, David and I want to actually talk to you about what some of the things you think are the most scary about Drupal, right? So, um, we're going to run through some of the things our teams have found the most scary uh, about Drupal. We'll run through them really quickly. I imagine that there's going to be a fair amount of overlap. But what we, we really want to do um, is start scribing, right? Uh, and the fact that we've got this recording is going to help us uh, keep track uh, of some of what uh, th the things are that you find the most scary. Um, and scary, uh, we mean that in the broad sense of the term, causes you anxiety, keeps you up at night, maybe it makes your stakeholders very nervous, maybe it's something that you are quite comfortable with, but you find it very unpleasant to have to explain to other people, right? So um, this is a pretty broad l list. Uh, so, uh, but uh, it's usually things that at some level or another you take home with you at the end of the day, right? And you're worrying and thinking, hmm, I wonder how this is going to turn out. Um, uh, and, you know, it could be something very technical. It could be something uh, around your business drivers. It could be uh, any number of, of things. Um, David and I have been scared by Drupal for quite a few years. Uh, I have spending my uh, this is going to be my 14th year uh, in the Drupal uh, community, and, and David has been uh, scared at a, a much deeper level because uh, he's contributed a heck of a lot more code uh, and, uh, than, I, than I have and a whole bunch of other things. So we have experienced being scared by, by Drupal. Um, uh, right, David? Yep. So at FFW... Uh, we've also been scared by, by Drupal many times. Uh, one of the things, though, because we are a good team that does a lot of different things, uh, is we've learned how to kind of face the monster in the, in the room and address our fears. So we're going to talk about some of that and share some of that as well. Some of these projects uh, have been a little scary, um, but we've come together and deliver uh, great results. Uh, for our clients, as we are apt to do, um, and uh, support the community in so doing. So, uh, but um, I'm, wa I'm wondering, you're all here because you find uh, Drupal s scary. I want to, at the end of it, have a, a show of hands uh, about what kind of scary uh, you are most, mo how you're scared most of the time. So I want to know if you're scared like this guy, Okay, at least some of the, t of the time. Okay, I think that this person um, could be scared about things that fit into this list. Things that um, they've started, they knew were a risk, they happened anyway, or maybe they were just surprised about. So uh, I've got three lists like this. This is the longest. Okay, we're going to go through them really quickly and in blurry fashion as I bunk the projector screen. Um, but let's hear from folks. And let me walk around here because I can't read that, David. Can you? Barely. Yeah. I, this is, I'm scared of the placement of this projector screen. I mean, I don't need to read it because I totally know what's on all the yes, slides. Yes, exactly. So how many people are scared of updates? Why? Or are we scared about updates for they're easy, right? No, we found them to be even among some of our most experienced users, they're terrified uh, by updates. Deployments. They're scared. Now, I wonder about, about the, this, and I'm interested in hearing, David, your opinion, because we've spoken about this many times, but not recently. Um, 
I think deployments is one of these things that you actually don't have to be scared uh, about too much because you can actually deploy many times. I think the scariest thing about deployments for most people is that they don't realize that they can deploy many times in preparation for go live. Go live, well, you do that once, right? And in order for that not to be scary, you have to practice deploying. So this is kind of the, 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 the approach that we're going to try to lend to these scary things that we encounter. Right, right, sort of what's the medicine that we can all take? What's the habit of mind that we can all adapt to address some of these shit scary things and actually kind of share with our colleagues and maybe some of the less technical decision makers and stakeholders in our organizations when they hear about how scary Drupal is because people like me have sessions like this and David, right? So unknowing clients, projects where the product owners have not been able to come to a consensus on what they want. No one's encountered that, right? Has anyone not encountered that? See, so we, we uh, live in a world where we hope that our stakeholders are all pulling in the same direction. But in reality, it's quite scary because we know that they can switch gears and change direction uh, at any given time, point in time. D7 config management. Who still does D7 config management? So a lot of people have moved to Drupal 8, okay? You're, you are veterans of, of this ex experience. Um, do you, have you, I'm curious to know, have each of you also done D8 configuration management? Yes. And are you raring to, to get rid of those D7 sites or have them move into D8? Yes. Yeah. So, so there's a, a thing that from our past that keeps sort of, you know, trying to grab us. Right? And for some folks, they're living with that a legacy uh, every day. And we'll talk about um, a short list of things that we can do to help make these things maybe not less scary, but more manageable. So uh, 200 databases, 200 websites, one database. Anyone? Yes. I know Olga. Olga works for us at FFW. <laughs> she has done many things, including uh, one of our QA uh, engineers, and I know for a fact that that's been a scary <laughs> experience. How many people are just overjoyed and embrace and tell people how wonderful native search is in Drupal on a regular basis? It's not. <laughs> okay. But it's a scary thing. Why? Anybody? I know why I think it's a scary thing. Hard to configure. It's hard to configure. It's actually hard to work with. Why else is it scary? User expectations. Thank you. User expectations. Oh, Drupal can do, has a search. Awesome. And then you're in the position of saying, well, kind of, sort of, let me explain. Okay. So um, s mismatching expectations is kind of rough. Because after all, Google has ruined search for the rest of the world, right? It's, it's everyone expects the same experience that they get from something like Google. Too many authenticated users, anybody? When I first started working in Drupal, it was four or six, I thought everybody should be authenticated. That didn't last for very long, right? I had 200 uh, working artists logging into a, a Drupal 4.7 uh, site, and it, you know, ground to a halt, basically. basically. So uh, their expectations around Drupal uh, performing well and being able to offer all this functionality based upon authenticated users. And I think, you know, this is not something that just David and I dreamed up of. This was something from all our development teams folks were quite scared of. Are you going to be this kind of scared, right? As in maybe surprised or you didn't know that that could be. We find a lot of our marketing and communications folks, a lot of our less technical folks, are this kind of surprised, right? And this list is probably pretty long, but this is the list we came up with in our organization. Obviously, we have a lot of technical folks uh, weighing in. But they were scared about the things that they didn't know. They were scared about expectations versus reality because they've heard so many different things about uh, Drupal. There was a lot of overlap, right? And they were, you know that, 
that point about consensus on the first slide, they expressed it in a similar way. I mean, they called it a moving target, right? So they're not quite sure what, to what needs to be delivered. So we're not quite sure what to develop for them. They're not quite sure what they want. And the other thing that they're scared of, because I think that there's a lot of inertia, are these legacy integrations, bespoke systems, no devs. I want to folks think about this list in general. Scary stuff? Should I replay the scary music? Not so much? Or any, do any of these r resonate for you as developers? How many developers in the room? Do any of those resonate for you as developers? Or is this more on the side of uh, the communications person, the marketer? I think it is. So it's important to know what keeps other people up at night about Drupal, and we think that that's where this list and many more items come to it. So one of the things that became clear to us when we're actually going through this exercise of trying to understand things that uh, made them hesitate before they were to use Drupal, right? It was a real exercise for us to kind of try to understand it from both sides of the coin. Right, so clearly more technical folks are scared of one set of things. Less technical folks, um, uh, marketing, communications, content uh, developers, maybe they're scared of some of those same things, but they're scared in a different way or they're scared of a completely different set. As evangelists of Drupal, it's kind of on us and on all of you, right, to understand what their fears are and to kind of help ex them understand how to uh, manage those, those fears. Um, because the fears are real, right? Whether or not um, the cause of it is uh, something that needs to be addressed. So then I think that there's actually a pretty big category of um, scary things that are, are really just things that make you crazy, right, about Drupal. Right, over and over again. And maybe there are things that have existed you know, for years and we can't seem to change. My little one that just bugs me to no end is how come we can't keep the save button on the screen all the time when we're configuring Drupal? How come sometimes it has to be at the top of the screen or the bottom of the screen or every once in a while it's in the middle and you don't know whether it has to go up or down? Now, when we use Drupal every day, eh, big deal. We go up, we go down, we know where the save button is, but for folks who are using it every once in a while, right, they're a content creator, it's kind of a big deal. Like, you need to know where the save button is, otherwise you're gonna forget there is one, and you're not gonna hit save, or submit as the case may be. So, under the category of things that make you crazy, um, we had a short but kind of powerful list, right? Folks were really afraid of breaking something. And, and so um, I'm privileged to direct the training and enablement unit at FFW. I do a lot of training and, and talking. And we talk about Drupal in the context not just of specific tasks, how to do A, how to do B, how to build a module, configure a module, whatever, but we talk about how folks across your organization can adopt this new thing that you just paid upwards of $100,000 for, right? And we found that if we don't build things a certain way, we get a lot of resistance because folks are really nervous about breaking something. So that when we can build something in such a way and convey to them that they don't have to worry that much, whether it's a matter of content creation or a significant configuration, or even in development, that there's a way to handle each of those steps where you won't irreparably break something, right? For developers, we kind of know that there's a workflow according to our code. But many other folks don't know that there can also be a workflow for that configuration to save it, and there can certainly be a workflow to manage your content, right? Where you can keep track of revisions and the, and the like. So this fear of breaking things, I actually think is greater in Drupal than it is 
in, uh, in other systems like WordPress because there's this <laughs> tendency to see Drupal as much more powerful, right, and much more complex. So I think as uh, evangelists, we can do an awful lot to build uh, with, with Drupal in such a way that we can give folks reasonable assurances that as, as long as they don't do this, that, or the other thing, okay, and we configure it in that manner, they won't ca cause irreparable harm. They won't take their site down, right? Um, how many people work with paragraphs? How many people love working with paragraphs? Yeah, and one of the reasons, right, um, and I'm glad there are people that love working with paragraphs, right, but I, th I think one of the reasons why not all of the same hands went up for those that love it and those that, that work with it is because um, paragraphs can get kind of confusing kind of fast, right? There's no visual representation um, out of the box of what paragraphs you're populating and arranging. Certainly, we can build, um, uh, uh, I hesitate to call them displays, right? But we, we can build um, out accompanying pages and, and links to help folks <laughs> understand what it is that they are assembling, uh, or what have you. But in, in our effort to give the user or the, uh, the site manager a lot of uh, ability ar around the manipulation of their page layout, we've, we've created some very complicated scenarios for other folks. So too many paragraphs is something that as developers I think we need to be sensitive to because I think we're finding that folks are a little put off by it. So broad definition is scared. Right? And HTML. How many times do we get, do you all get requests for a little HTML button inside of the WYSIWYG, right? And we still get that quite a bit. These folks have put a lot of time and effort into their old websites and gosh darn it, they've got a table, right? And they really want that table to look as good in the new site as it does in the old site. And content management system be damned. Okay, they want to be able to paste that HTML into a body field and have it look the same way. Well, of course we can look at that. We can do that for them. We don't, but we could. And we don't do it, of course, because if we do, that's when Drupal starts to get very scary. Okay, you realize, oh, that table was not accessible. Oh, that table was not responsible. Oh, that table cannot be manipulated in ways that you would expect to manipulate it because you're using a content management system. You can't make HTML bend to your will like you can a data-driven application like Drupal. So um, I would like to hear uh, from you all uh, about um, some of the things that you're, you're scared about. Uh, we're going to uh, listen very closely, uh, and we're going to talk about uh, how we address them. Um, uh, and then we're going to talk about sort of the habits of mind that we have uh, along the way. One of the things that our survey of developers did not um, uh, surface is something that bothers me about Drupal 8 in particular. And I wouldn't say it's kept me up at night, right? But I, it, it worries me that folks are not doing the right thing or using it, and it didn't come, come up. I do know that the folks coming into this room, okay, for the next session, we're going to talk quite a bit about it. And so I recommend that if you don't know where you're going to go, you stay uh, in the room to uh, listen to uh, is it Brian and Becca who are going to be here talking about some different solutions. But that is... Oops, slide out of order. You're, you're going to get your turn. But that is headless Drupal, right? So I'm, I'm quite concerned about folks that get very excited about decoupling Drupal and using these awesome new JavaScript libraries and other things that we've got uh, access to nowadays. And then waking up on a Sunday morning and realizing, oh, wow, does that mean I have to code this entire random piece of Drupal back end that ships out of the box? in this new technology. And so this idea of 
headless Drupal being the greatest thing in the world, I think it's quite scary because I think folks will invest a lot of time and effort into it and not realize all the things that are over 20 years we've put into the system and that they don't have to necessarily recreate. So I'm, I'm scared of people overusing uh, this and, and the, the relief for that is folks understanding how to progressively decouple uh, Drupal and that's what the next talk in this room is going to be about, I think. Right? Yep. All right. So, um, so let's hear. What are some of the things that you all are scared about Drupal that are, are not on the list? Did we miss anything? David, this list is, well, about six months old. I don't know if any of mine are Drupal specific. My scariest thing is taking over somebody else's project. Taking over somebody else's project. Good one. <laughs> Place builders stuff for Drupal. Like when client wants to have ability build some variety of landing page with different sets of uh, blocks, mm -hmm. maybe do some. They want all the power. Yeah. They want all the control. And you have only that layout builder, which was experimental recently and mm -hmm. have a lot of issues still. And you either should build something custom or use some third-party models which do it similar to WordPress but not in Drupal way, so don't use that fields and all the stuff. So, so I'm, that's, I'm hearing a lot in there. I'm hearing layout builder can be scary for a couple of different reasons, because it's new and because people don't under, understand it and because it can sometimes give people too much control over their layouts. Right? And I'm also hearing that it can be very scary to work with folks when they're coming from other systems like WordPress and have different expectations. Did I get that right? So it sounds like the client says, oh, we have like Drupal 7 website. I understand everything about Drupal 7, but we also have like microsites made via WordPress and we were able to do that. <laughs> completely custom, fancy, sync with different colors, like all the stuff. Can we do that in Drupal 8? Like, yep. not to use WordPress, but do it directly in Drupal. And, you're, we're, and we're afraid that they're going to build a Frankenstein. Like, <laughs> how many, uh, what else? What else are we scared of? Did Definitely you inherited. PHP before? No, <laughs> no. I used to be very scared of the PHP filter. I'm Let's hear more. You know other JavaScript platforms and things not called PHP are way bigger than these conferences are. Uh, I mean in that perspective. Yes. Like, I'm less concerned about being stuck on the Drupal Island so much as the PHP Island, just as a whole. I mean, if you see, uh, there's a faculty member I know teaching Python to a global audience. He educates five to 600,000 students a year in Python for web development. That's gonna catch up with us. Wow. It's gonna eat Java, it's gonna eat PHP. Like he's he's gonna win basically. <laughs> so the we're, so in other words, when we're playing in our nice sandbox, thinking that that everything um, uh, is moving along nicely, there's this huge lurking external menace that we are not paying that much attention to, getting ready to eat us. Do I get that right? Yep. Yeah. So I mean, I think that that. So I. Um, that's scary. I, I used to be a management consultant, and one of the things that I was charged with doing with folks was creating strategic plans, right? And so how many folks have heard of SWATs, right? right? You have your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats. And strengths and weaknesses are internal. And I would dare say that when we come to these events, we spend a lot of time talking about our strengths and our weaknesses, and probably not nearly enough time as a community talking about the opportunities that are out there for us, something I know, I think, Brian, you spend a lot of time on, and not nearly enough time talking about some of these external threats. Like, we always think, oh, is WordPress or Adobe going to steal our lunch? But there's, there are some external threats out there that we probably don't pay nearly enough attention to. So um, I think that that fits into the category of the unknown, things that are, are knowable and that we it's a good, a good, uh, a good statement for us to pay attention to. <laughs> yeah. What else? Please, Matt. So, despite David's wonderful training, he, uh, 
the hook system in Drupal 7 is a nightmare. <laughs> Chills. Chills. The hook system in Drupal 7. Took a while to get used to that entire concept. Yeah. And so I asked a very specific question the year before, but how many folks are generally still working with Drupal 7 sites? Quite a few. Yeah, quite a few, right? And do, uh, uh, I, if many of you, whether or not you're working on them for yourself or with clients, are, are you going to be ready or do you think your clients are going to be ready to get out of Drupal 7 at end of life? Wait, or, I didn't hear the question, but... Well, for those of you that are working with Drupal 7, do you feel that you your own projects, you'll be ready, or your clients will be ready to leave Drupal 7 uh, before end of life, before s support disappears from the community. How many folks think that they're going to be ready to do that be by end of life? Well, it's not necessarily like a matter of being, being ready or making the argument, like people know they have to upgrade and, and migrate, right? But like really there's like there's a learning curve with Drupal 8, they changed the entire way yeah, that you for sure. Develop. And then, like, add to that the fact that, like, I'm in the government, so we move slowly as <laughs> Right? So, like, I mean, because there's bureaucracy and layers upon layers of approvals, and then, like, it's, it's not a matter of, like, are we afraid, or is it, is it going to happen by the end of life? It's, it's literally, like, our site is bloated, we're, we're working through it, you know, like... This Your hands are tied. basically, not in many really. ways. I mean, we're in the process of migrating to Drupal 8, but, like, our flagship site is... God, I mean, we're the National Archives. We, we handle the records of the entire government. Like, you know, it's like moving that kind of information is a challenge. And, and doing it in an effective manner that also improves the user experience is really what we're, we're, our goal is with the migration. So like getting all of those ducks in a row and then getting it all approved and then migrating is, is you know what I mean? Like add to that the other project we're maintaining. I think that's that's really worth worthwhile. So we're, in some ways we're talking about technical debt but it's really all about all the other machinations and processes that we have to get in line in order to address issues of technical debt and, and uh, updating and, and, and security. And that's, uh, I don't know if, if scary is exactly the right word, but daunting. R right, right. It, it can be overwhelming. There's a lot of factors yeah. that you need to like make sure that you factor in, and then you know add to that that like it's not just I don't know because like we do have Drupal 8 sites and, and we, we manage those and we've, we've maintained those and we're upgrading tons of sites currently um, and they're all going through like the same rigorous process that involves like a massive amount of user research in order to like, focus on the UX of everything. So, so but this is very good. Um, feedback for us and hopefully for you, because I know what we're going to do with it when we get back to the offices. We're going to try to think of some material that we can put together that I, as a director of training and enablement, can put together that, and, and that hopefully we can take back to the Drupal community and say, okay, how can we address these issues that are being raised? Not just these fun, scary issues, right, uh, that are also sometimes over overwhelming, but these institutional issues that uh, are truly impediments to broad progress, right? It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm scared it might snow tomorrow, but I'm kind of, that's urgent, but more importantly, I'm, I'm scared that if all the icebergs melt, that, you know, the highest peak is gonna be surrounded by water. The one other thing that that I would say would be beneficial is maybe like a roadmap, like a general roadmap of sorts of like things that you need to do in order to migrate, right? Because it's, and, and like, especially as like small teams, you know, teams yeah. of one, two, three, which you find a lot, especially in the federal government because there's just not funding for more developers. And, and so a lot of that might include impediments. Like I was talking to one gentleman from New Jer from a state run office in New Jersey uh, and they were having this age-old argument about open source versus proprietary and whether or not they could build something on on Drupal or, 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 or not so something a list uh, uh, that might actually include process items like that right and not just Drupal items right like things that you need to check off before you get ready to migrate like 
are you is your information architecture actually legit? Like, does are your users finding what they need? And you know, really utilizing the analytics data that you're getting in an effective manner, and how that might what that might look. And I realize like what that might look like, and I realize that, that might not necessarily be in your wheelhouse, but like, because I don't I don't know, um, but. But like it's it's something that most people ignore and or don't take into account when they're getting ready to migrate necessarily, just because it's a lot of work if you're going to overhaul your information architecture. And but I think history. every really every website should have a roadmap. And right, it helps alleviate some of those problems. I mean, people wait for a certain point where they're, they're like, okay, now we have to figure this stuff out. Whereas if long term you've actually been planning those things and taking care of those on a on a, like a quarterly or yearly basis. It alleviates a lot of that pressure when you get to a point where then you need to actually do something about it. Yeah. So, Ray, can I ask you a question? Please. So, you want to take this back to develop plans. And I think your climate change, that what you were trying to say with that, is an interesting paradigm. Because, like, do you have any planning around sustainability or talk to your clients about sustainability? Because what I've, at least over yeah. the years, I've noticed, and I'm not blaming you guys at all, yeah. but like there's definitely a difference between being on the implement the side where the things get implemented and your company coming in and building, not you specifically, but any company, right? Mm -hmm. Your goal is this one project and done. My goal is maintain that one project as well as the 20 before it and the next 10 after it. And it's just a very different sure. style of planning. And for the longest time, Drupal's been that bedrock for us in education or government or in the institution class of like, well, if you do it in Drupal, well, we already have all these other Drupal IP. I think that requires some experience and intelligence on developers. Like, I fight that even when it's not a project that I'm going to continue to maintain, because I spent most of my career doing exactly that working internally. So like, we build stuff and I'll tell the clients, like, you don't want to build this this way. And they're like, well, we want this particular feature. And I'm like, we want it right now, but six months from now, <laughs> it's going to be a disaster. And I think, fortunately, we work with so many clients where we don't tend to be a building ship it. Yeah. We're usually long term with those clients. So we know, like, I know, like, I'm working on a, with a client right now that I've been working with for a year and a half. I'm like, I know, six months from now, this is going to change. And I'm going to be the one that's changing it because we're still under contract with them. Uh, and so you have to fight that sometimes. Or just That's communication. Like, Making sure that you have meetings and uh, trust with your client that they are, like when you're giving them advice, you're not just telling them no. You're explaining why, you're getting them to understand, like, and not necessarily no. It's just like this is not the best way to do that. There's probably another way to do that that's better, and I want you to understand that like these are the consequences for all of the things that you're asking for. Make sure we understand what those consequences are, and if that ultimately is what you want, then you just make sure you can mitigate those consequences or you just deal with them. Like, yes, we know this is going to be the result and that's almost what we're expecting is going to be the result. Whether it's like massive amounts of data that you end up with or something that becomes harder to maintain, but like you know that because of some particular <coughs> functionality that you're dealing with. As long as that's on the table and everybody understands it, then usually that's easier to manage. But the problem is when people don't understand the consequences for all those things that they're doing. And I think that, and that's one of the intersections, right? One of the opportunities for intervention that we as an organization at FFW have, have I think, sought out and very uh, happily um, built the support to, re to respond around. Um, because it, it speaks to one of our core beliefs, which is that our, our work is based around our relationships. And so there's a, a, a built to flip model, right? Uh, and and we, are, are, we don't subscribe to, basically. And that's exactly the type of stuff that, that David is talking about. But that's very easy when you know, you're an order, a global organization with almost 400 you know, staff on it. And when you're small and hungry, right, you are, are looking for the next project. I think that though that from the point of view of sustainability, okay, it's actually a really important habit of mind to nurture and say, and say, what if this was gonna be, you know, one of my main two or three or four clients for the next 20 or 30 years? How would I build stuff? How would I nurture this relationship? And I know there are folks in this room, Jacob and you and other folks that are, are not part of huge organizations, but you've maintained those relationships with clients over, over the years, over many years. So I think that's an important way um, to, to do it. There's some really interesting 
liter literature, and not necessarily specifically addressed to tech, but around entrepreneurship and, and um, um, uh, creativity um, before uh, Good to be Great, which is the Ed Collins book, there was the Built to Last book by Ed uh, Collins and Porus, uh, 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 so social economists. Uh, and then I think that there's some lessons that come forward from that type of work around this type of engagement. So some of this stuff, if we're approaching it from the right perspective with our clients and we're educating them, shouldn't really be scary, right? Because we've, we've you know, um, uh, internalized, they've been able to internalize it uh, with them. So I know we're like at 100,000 feet up, up here, but um, I think it's worthy, worth, worth, worth talking about. And particularly when you consider everything we just spoke about with what we spoke about a few moments ago around these external threats and people building, you know, in Python like, you know, crazy and what kind of a threat does that represent to the Drupal and even the PHP community? So. I would say the, the opposite can also be true if you're very careful, right? So you want to build things to last if you know it's a project that's meant to last, but if it's not, and there's a very clear understanding that it's not, yeah. those so are opportunities be where you can do things fast and lose, right? And like so, a lot of times those are the learning experiences, right? We're going to do something new, we're going to do it crazy, it's going to be terrible, but it's going to work, and we know six months from now this site's not going to last anymore, so we're going to chuck it, we're going to learn from it, and we're going to do something different next time. Like, that's okay. Right? And then a lot of times that gives you a lot less overhead and makes the project a little less scary because you're more inclined to not be afraid of making mistakes when you know there are no long-term consequences because that entire project's not meant to exist long-term. We've also been doing a lot more work around um, um, customer experience, user experience. We've been doing a lot more work directly around strategy and user research. And I'm curious, how many folks are in design and user research UX? Right? There we go. Right? So a couple of folks. But one of the things that scares me, and I think scares a lot of my, my colleagues, is that after we're done talking to all the stakeholders, after we're done talking to all the technical folks, we build something that's really great and that doesn't get used because we didn't take into account the user's needs. And I'm not saying there's bad UX, right? We've maybe still done a really great job with UX, but we've built something that is either not needed anymore or is built in a way that's less than helpful for folks. And I think that there are many examples out in the wild of projects like that that get launched uh, and then don't go anywhere because they they weren't what people needed at the time. So every time, you know, if we build something and we make a lot of money building it and it's a, we are successful according to the terms of the scope, but the project is not successful. In other words, it doesn't have legs. It doesn't get used and viewed. It's not a high level of adoption. We don't win. That's a loss for us because it means we've wasted our time. We could be building something that would be highly regarded in the community, highly regard regarded in the marketplace. These are, you know, again, meta issues, but I think that they, they part of what we discovered is that some of the things that we were scary, scared about with Drupal, some of the most scary things about Drupal weren't Drupal things. They were web things, and they were technology things, and they were human things. Anything else? Please. So I can say two things. Uh, one would be performance and caching. Mm. Um, not just performance as it relates to, oh, we got a million users this day, and the site was slow. I mean, just like the overall rendering of the site and caching. Um, different layers of caching. I think in Drupal 8, it's gotten pretty complex. Like, the layering you know, is you know, Two hour conversations on cache tags, right? Yeah. Um, at least. So like, what's happening in the caching side? Are things actually caching properly? Are they not caching properly? Uh, is varnish working? Is it not working? And then if you have a CDN on top of that. And that is very Drupal specific. Receiving, you went from like, well, you know, performance is shit, caching is not working properly, to over caching. And then your client publishes content and they're like, it didn't go live. And you're like, well, 
Yeah. Conflict. Yeah. Do, right? So that would be one thing. And I think the second thing is, especially in Drupal 8, getting clients to understand how Drupal works and where to edit content seems to be really, really difficult, especially because everything is scalable, everything's an entity. But to a client, content is content. Right, so should it be in a block? Should, it be, should it be as like, in a oh, user? Well, that actually is a block. Well, why is that a block? Yeah. Or even now in, in taxonomy, you have fields. So there have been. Taxonomy becomes content. And they're like, well, why am I going here to do this? I agree. Here to do that, here to do that. And then views, forget it. Unintended so, and unforeseen <clears throat> consequences of fields are everywhere. Fields are everywhere, which is yeah. great. Yeah. Everything is fieldable. Yeah. But try, you can get sites where like, the client is just like, None of this makes sense. Forms inside of forms. Your yeah. first one is this, I have this big giant bucket of, I know what's wrong, but I don't know what to do to fix it. Yeah. Right? And like, to me, those are one of the scariest things. Like I could sit at something all day long and then you go on a, a phone call the next day. And I go, I can explain the entire thing. I know everything that's going on and I don't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, well, can you fix it by the end of the day? And I'm like, I just told you, <laughs> I don't know what to do. Okay, so I, don't, I want to be conscious of um, uh, the time. Um, thank you for sharing. I hope discussing these things have been um, somewhat helpful. I, I, I think our goal was to capture some of this, work with it, and put it out there so that um, maybe other folks know the answer, but certainly we could also try to think of some good ones along the way. Um, there are some habits of mind that we spoke about um, to deal with uh, the scary things and the monster uh, under the bed. And so let's close on that. Some of these, I think, will have a lot of value, and some of them are kind of footnotes, right? Things that uh, are just that, habits of mind. Um, in order to face these monsters, we like to work with a really good team, okay? We think uh, we make a really good team at FFW. Um, you need a team too. If, if you are an individual uh, working with, with Drupal, you need your peeps, all right? And some of these scary things become a lot less scary when you have uh, a team to work with, folks that you can turn to. So whether, it doesn't need to wait for a camp uh, to happen. So one of the, the ways that, that we're able to deliver and face these scary things and we don't have answers on our own is share this information and reach out and talk to other people. So here our team ready to face all the, the scary things. And then once we're together, we realize, well, maybe these scary things aren't actually that scary. They may be big and hairy, okay? But there are maybe some things that we could do to appease them, okay? Like give them cookies. Um, and so that monster may start out as being really challenging, but once we surrounded ourselves with people that can help us and that can reassure us, reassure us, lend us a hand. Once we also de develop these habits of mind, then we can actually experience the joy and the thrill of facing down some of these uh, fears and being successful. And I think all of us do that on an everyday basis because we're figuring things out in Drupal. But we have to learn to kind of routinize it, right, on a regular basis. Right, so that when, when, we're, when we're down, something really bugs us. We, we like to have, uh, we should celebrate the euphoria of actually facing down some of these, these fears. And so the habits of mind that we keep talking about uh, are pretty straightforward, right? Practicing everything, the point we make about deployment and practicing everything. Embracing one another and why we're here today. Contributing, communicating, um, free trainings, investing in paid trainings. Um, there are a lot of folks here that have tremendous uh, training av available. We do a lot of training these days around bespoke systems, uh, and we certainly still do a lot of other other training. And a lot of, when we do a lot of training around some of these strategy issues as well these days. But of course, still Drupal training too. So um, the strategy. Um, is can't be other under uh, emphasized and very practical activities like a, vi a, a vigorous discovery can really help shed some light on these things. Like we tend to, you know, we have this this visual history 
right, where the things that we don't see are scary, okay? A discovery process sheds light on them and surfaces these things. And so we may find some scary things, but when we can see them, we can begin to deconstruct them, understand them, uh, and become successful. So thank you for your time and for your effort. We want to be able to have you sleep well at night and em embrace uh, the scary monster uh, under the bed. So uh, thank you uh, very much. I hope you're having a great uh, camp. Yeah. And say uh, for Brian and Becca. Yeah. I got the bucket. Yeah. So do I press the red button again? Uh, what does it say? Yeah. I do, right? Stop. Yeah, press the button.